These are the confidential counsels which Yahuwah gave to Yeshua HaMashiach. I have lost contact. Are you there? No. With yeah. Rob and Michael. But can that is me? okay because. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> we can all, all right. hear each other. So I think we're good. So from with that, we're going to move on to the confidential councils. So let's begin. Shabbat Shalom for the second time this evening. And I say that, of course, because we cut this into two different videos. And I'm going to be opening up reading chapter 9 of Hebrew Revelation, also known as the Confidential Councils of Yahuwah. So let's begin. Then the fifth messenger blew, and I saw that a star fell onto the earth from the heavens, and to him the key of the deep was given. Then he opened the deep, and there went out smoke from the deep, like the smoke of a great oven, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the deep. And from the smoke there came locusts over the earth, and authority was given to them to destroy. And it was said to them that you must not damage the green plants, or the plants of the field, or the trees, but only the sons of man who do not have the seal of Yahuwah on their foreheads. And it was given to them not to kill them, but to inflict them with pain for five months. And their pain was like the pain of scorpions when they sting. And in those days you will act wisely to die, but you will not find it. And the locusts were like horses that are prepared for war. And on their heads were something like crowns of gold. And their appearance was like the appearance of man. And their hair was like the hair of women. And their teeth were like the teeth of a lion. And their trials were like the... I'm sorry, and, the, and their tails were like the tails of locusts. And authority was given to them to inflict the sons of man with pain for five months. And their king was a messenger of the deep, and his name in the Hebrew tongue is Avadon. And in the Greek tongue, Apollyon. One pain has passed away. Look, two more pains are coming. Then the sixth messenger blew, and I heard a voice from the four corners of the temple before Yahuwah. And it said to the sixth messenger who blew, Go and loosen the four messengers who are bound at the great river, which is called Parat. This is where we get the river Euphrates in Greek. And these four messengers were made ready to kill the third of the sons of man in an hour and in a day and in a month and in a year. And the number of their riders was 20 million. And I heard their number. And after this, I saw the shapes of the horses and those who sat on them that they had garments of pitch and sulfur and fire. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of the lion. And from their mouths there went out fire and smoke and sulfur. And by these three, the third of the sons of man were killed. For their power was in their mouth, and their tails were like serpents, and they had heads, and with these they killed them. But there were still many sons of man who did not die by these plagues because they did repentance from their evil deeds by not praying to Hasatan, neither to the idols which are made of pottery and of stone or wood and silver and gold, which do not have the ability in them to walk or to speak or to hear, but who did not do repentance concerning their sorceries or concerning their fornication or concerning their thefts. So I think we are handing it over to you, Rob. Okay, uh, last week I did not do any slides on chapter 8, and I did finish those slides for chapter 8, and I just want to drop them in and briefly uh, talk about it. And on chapter 8, the only part I wanted to talk about in that was the, the comment on the sun, moon, and stars being stricken. We talked about a third of the day and the night did not shine. Um, did it drop into the... Where is it not going? 
Let's see if it goes in there. Looks like I'm having a hard time dropping them in. They're not going in. All right. And then I'll drop the other one in, see if that goes. Oh, you can see it. Good. Okay. All right. And so, so that's uh, the silence in heaven and starting the seven shofar blasts. So that's uh, shofar one, two, three, and four of the, those trumpets. And obviously chapter nine, we're going into five and six. So uh, what I wanted to follow up on trumpet number four with the sun, moon, and stars is the part regarding tying it in with Enoch chapter 79 and some books it's chapter 80. If you compare those, you will see a, a, a pretty similar description. And I'm only going to spend a minute on this and then, and then move forward because we're on chapter 9. But when you look at Enoch chapter 79 or 80, uh, in the day of sinners, the year shall be shortened. So Enoch's talking about in the day of sinners, the years shall be shortened. And, and talk, talking about the, the, uh, the seed will be backward, uh, the earth shall be subverted the, and disappear in its season. There'll be, the rain will be restrained, uh, you know, the season not flourish in their season, the fruits in the trees will be withheld, the changes in the order uh, not to be seen in proper period. So there's this whole seasonal changes going on in this, this prophesied event. And it talks about the, the stars, the, and, and it speaks to the, the chief among the stars, the authority shall err perverting their ways and works, those shall not appear in their season. So this whole change of season, stars, all of this stuff, and, and when we read in the, the fifth trumpet that the sun, moon, and stars are stricken, one third day and night did not shine, and if you compare that with Enoch 79, if that is a direct tie-in to that uh, prophecy, then I, I would have to presume a couple options, and I mentioned them last week, was eight hours of day and night stricken to make each day perhaps 16 hours. So totally throwing off the seasons and causing a real climate change, <laughs> so to speak. So, uh, you know, that's just something I just wanted to throw in regarding last week's uh, uh, fifth trumpet, and I will move on to chapter nine. All right, so chapter nine, I'll drop this in. All right, so the fifth star, uh, or the fifth uh, shofar blast here, is a star uh, that fell upon the earth with the key of the deep. And we see that the star is a, is a being, a messenger, an angel. He opens the deep. We see smoke coming out, and then the sun and the air was darkened from the smoke. Now, where it says locust here, when uh, I was reviewing with Ronit on, on these Hebrew words, and we see that this is the, the, this war term for locust is what's used in uh, like when uh, Eve was to have the, this uh, multiple sorrows put upon her, that word for the multiple. What is is the word for locus? So it's like uh, uh, countless. Uh, it's just the these these sorrows. Um, so here, if, if we plug in that word and put it as countless or multi multiple or multitudes, we see that uh, these destroying multitudes or countless ones inflict pain like a scorpion for five months to those who do not have the seal or signature of Yahweh on their foreheads. So there's a seal or signature that's placed upon the foreheads of the set apart. Uh, they, the people of the world, will try to die but cannot. The countless ones look like humanoids armored for battle with golden-like crowns on their heads. They have hair like women, teeth of a lion, and long tails. So this is what we pulled out of the Hebrew that was there. Humanoids armored for battle. So that, that could be like uh, scaled skins, like a dragon, a serpent, uh, a, 
and then some type of golden crown or crowns of gold on their head, hair like women, and these these fanged teeth like lions and a long tails. Uh, the me the angel king of the deep named Destruction or Apollyon is their their leader, and we see here in uh, Joel one two through six a tie in. Hear this, you elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it, and have your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation what the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locust has left, what the creeping locust has eaten, what the creeping locust has left, and what the stripping locust has eaten away, you heavy drinkers and weep and wail, all you, all you wine drinkers, because of the sweet wine, for it has been eliminated from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has jaws of a lioness. So he's describing a nation that's mighty and without number, which ties in with this description with teeth of a lion to these type of creatures described here in Revelation, countless. It says without number. And the word for locusts is multitudes. So tying in the countless ones, inflicting this pain, is like this mighty without number that's spoken about in Joel here, where literally before that, it's talking about different types of locusts or multitudes of what they're going to be doing uh, unto the land, or, sh or should I say, unto the people, causing such great pain. And then I want to tie in a picture what I closely, and this is not what I foresee this exact humanoid to be, but I see it as a close depiction, and I want to speak a little bit about it. So this humanoid is what I think the this countless one or locust, as they say, could could possibly look like in similitude, uh, where th this this humanoid would have some type of scale of scaled armor on it, like a perhaps like a dragon, as we understand, and uh, you know, it's ready for battle. I would probably add some type of golden crown and long hair like a woman on it, uh, and as you see, the teeth of a lion and the long tail, which talks about you know, causing a sting like um, uh, a scorpion. I mean, it could actually be multiple tails uh, from, from the translation is, is somewhat uh, uh, possible. Now, there is, a, there is folklore or mythologies that speak to a humanoid dragon, and they call it uh, Yuxa in the, in the Turkish mythology, Yuxa or Yuha, appearing as a humanoid dragons with barbed tails of scorpions. Uh, these Turkish shapeshifters are known to assume the form of beautiful human women to seduce unsuspected victims. They can breathe fire and have deadly poisonous stings. Now, now look, look at this part. Tatar mythology, the Kazan Tatars mythology, describes this creature as a demonic character associated with the water element. And... And everything above is the same as is what is here. I didn't, you know, copy it all down, but it, it's speaking about this uh, humanoid uh, creature with a uh, scorpion tail and and like dragon-like uh, uh, humanoid. So it's very interesting that this Tatar, whether it's you know Tartarian mythology, uh, speaks about this type of creature. So this is this is what i I picture as a description of these beings that are let loose uh, that will inflict pain upon the peoples except those who have the signature of the most high upon them. So I wanted to I'll stop with that and then I have more afterwards, but I'll pass it over to Michael. Thoughts. All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um... I'm going to start on number one. So Rob kind of hinted at it. I'm going to read the Hebrew. It says, uh, Then the fifth messenger blew, and I saw that a star fell unto the earth from the heavens, and to him the key of the deep was given. Um, I'm going to make two possibilities. One, is this Satan? So um, Isaiah 14, 12, how, how you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. And in Luke 10, 18, and he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. 
because it does say it, it says to him it appears to be an individual and a star um falling star uh, i'm going to make another possibility um in the very first confidential councils chapter one i in, I equated the seven angels in Enoch, Enoch passage, and one of those angels, Enoch 20, um, let's see, it would be number two, Uriel, one of the holy angels who's over the world and over Tartarus. So is this Uriel or Satan? I don't know. Maybe Noel can add his take on that as well. Um, number three, I'm going to read both. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And in the Hebrew, and from the smoke there came locusts over the earth, and authority was given to them to destroy. Um, I want to highlight that as the scorpions of the earth have power are missing in the Hebrew. I don't know what that means, but I just want to highlight that. And again, I want to point out the similarities between Revelation and Exodus. So Exodus 10, 12 through 15. Then Yahweh said, Yahuwah said to Moses, reach out with your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come up on the land of Egypt. And eat every plant of the land, everything that the hall hail was le has left. So Moses reached out with a staff over the land of Egypt, and, and Yah directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came over the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There had been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again, for they covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened. And they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that had hail had left um so in the john uh chapter john i talked about luke and my my theory on that um that it's it's still my opinion until i see that hebrew that luke is speaking to the set apart luke speaking to the 144,000. luke 10 19 says behold i have given you authority to walk on snakes and scorpions and authority all over the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you peers there they have no issue they don't have to worry about this this uh, judgment coming out on in Revelation, that they have the power to walk on them. And does this give you guys a new meaning, possibly, for that passage? Um, so that this set, set apart believers don't have really nothing to worry about as far as this is concerned. Um, number four, I'm going to read the Hebrew. Oh, I'm going to read both, actually. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And in the Hebrew, and it was said to them, you must not damage the green plants or the plants of the field or the trees, but only the sons of men who do not have the seal of Yahweh on their foreheads. So, you know, I'm going to highlight the difference. So only those men in the Hebrew, or in the Greek, it says only those men which have not the seal. In the Hebrew, it says sons of men. And I know there's, <laughs> there's a lot about the sons of men. You know, people... Yeshua is the son of man. So it's saying that these people with the mark are also the son of man. So the Hebrew expression son of man appears 107 times in the Hebrew Bible. The majority, 93 times, in the book of Ezekiel. So it is used in three main ways as a form of address, Ezekiel, to contrast the lowly status of humanity against the permanence and exalted dignity of Yah. And the angels, Numbers 23, 19, and Psalm 84, and a future eschatological figure, which is Yeshua, whose coming will signal the end of history in the time of God's judgment, Daniel 7. I just thought it was this interesting that these these people, these I guess these are the 144, are also called sons of men. I have a lot left. I'm going to do one more and I'll pass it off to Noel. I'm going to, number five, read the Hebrew. And it was given to them not to kill them, but to inflict them with pain for five months. And their pain was like the pain of scorpions when they sting. So I was doing some research, and ironically, which I, it's not ironic because Yah is perfect, the life cycle of a locust is five months. It hatched in the spring, and it died in the end of summer, or plague. And that's no coincidence. I have a lot more, but I'll pass it off to Noel for commentary. Well, you know what else lasted for five months was Noah's flood. So I'm going to write in here Genesis seven let's see what bible bot has to say here genesis 7 24 and the waters were mighty on the earth 150 days so you can do the math on that and if you're if you're estimating 30 day months that adds up exactly to five months now th this actually makes the connection to what you had originally asked michael what my thought was on who the star was 
my best guess is that this star is Hasatan. Now, we could argue that there are many Satans, right? But, you know, whoever this, this main Hasatan is, this, it's, it's this guy. So I'm going to, before, before tying him in with the flood account and why I think this is, I first want to look at the, the deep in verse one. And of course, in the Greek, it says the bottomless pit. So let's go back to, well, unfortunately, I can't put this in Bible bot, but the Genesis Targum, Genesis Targum chapter, uh, chapter one, verses one and two. This is what we read. At the beginning, Yahuwah created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was vacancy and desolation, solitary of the sons of men, and void of every animal. And it, it, it really, you get this sense here that something went down, something big happens, and now the earth is solitary. And it says, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss. Why was darkness of all places on the face of the abyss? That, that's really, it's very ominous, and it feels like, it really gives you the sense that there was this war of light and darkness going on. And so let's read a little bit further on what the abyss is. I'm going to see if I can drop in here uh, Jubilees. I'm not sure if Jubilees is going to come up. I haven't tested that yet. But Jubilees chapter 10 verses 1 through 9, because I want everybody to read this. Yes, I love it when BibleBot comes through. And this is the story of, contextually here, Noah and his family, they've just come off that five months of the flood, and they're, they're coming back on the earth, and they are being plagued by, by ruachs, by demons. Now, keep in mind, by these accounts, demons are the disembodied spirits of the what we would call the Nephilim, or maybe the Titans, that you know, the, the, the children of the Watchers. These are these are those that they're you know all the all flesh died in the flood, everything with the breath of life died, and yet here their spirits still remain to to haunt Noah and his family, and this is a problem. Okay, so this is where we're getting contextually here, and it says, and in the third week of this jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah and to make to err and destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah their father, and they told him concerning the demons, which were leading astray and, and blinding and slaying his son's sons. And he prayed before Yahuwah his Elohim and said, Elohim of the Ruachs of all flesh, who has shown mercy unto me, and has saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood, and has not caused me to perish as thou didst the sons of perdition. For thy grace has been great towards me. And great has been thy mercy to my soul. Let thy grace be lift up upon my sons, and let not wicked spirits rule over them, lest they should destroy them from the earth. But do thou bless me and my sons, that, w that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And thou knowest how the watchers, the fathers of these spirits, so that answers your question there, it's saying the watchers are the fathers of these demons acted in my day, and as for these spirits which are living, imprison them. And so it's interesting, he actually says that the spirits are still living. They're not like, they're not dead, right? They're, everything else died, but they're still here. And, he, and, he, and Noah's begging Yahuwah, and he says, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation, and let them not bring destruction on the sons of, of thy servants, my Elohim, for these are malignant and created in order to destroy. And let them not rule over the spirits of the living, for thou alone canst exercise dominion over them, and let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And Yahuwah our Elohim bade us to bind all. Now it's interesting here that Noah and his, it appears that Noah is the one that's binding them. Okay, like don't miss that point there. And the chief of the spirits, Mastima, so uh, Satan here, Hasatan, is identified as being called Mastima, came and said, now he's protesting, right? Now he's, he's the accuser and he's going before the Most High here and he's, he's protesting this decision. So listen to what he says. Adonai, creator, let some of them remain before me and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, 
I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men, for these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, uh, so this is Yahuwah responding, I believe. Let the tenth part of them remain before him, and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. So, if I'm getting the order of events right, th this great deep is like, uh, th this bottomless pit is a prison where these, where these spirits are cast. We saw that it was present at the creation account, that there was darkness looming over it. So that's really strange, and you know, wondering, well, what went on? Who's in there? Why? So now, um, Yahuwah is throwing these demons into the deep, this, this, um, the, the abyss. And he's throwing uh, 90 or 90% 90 of them in there. So when you can think about all the, all the demons on the earth, uh, that, that's just a tenth. That's just a tenth, according to this account of what's going on in Revelation. And they are then, you know, and I, so I think that the scene in Revelation is that other 90%. Being, I don't know if it's the whole ninety percent, but you know, a large amount of them coming out to destroy the earth. So with that, I will pass it back over to Rob. Okay, <clears throat> I will. I will go over to uh, the sixth trumpet, and here in this in, in this shofar blast, the sixth. The sixth one, a voice from the four corners of the temple said to go search out the four angels imprisoned by the great sea, Parat. All right, I'm going to drop this in so others can follow along. And I'm going to talk about these four angels. And my theory, and see if this uh, anyone is can see the same thing. All right. So the four angels, they're planning to kill one third of men at a precise time. When you read these verses, okay, they they have twenty million chariots or vehicles, and we also read about these vehicles in Psalm sixty-eight seventeen. The chariots of Elohim are twenty thousands, thousands of thousands. Yahweh came from the Sinai into the set apart place. So even in Psalms, it talks about twenty million chariots. And so here they have twenty million. Uh, these riders uh, are on some type of lion that breathes fire. The riders' garments are of tar, sulfur, and fire. Now. Three of the angels of the four, three of the angels, it says, it speaks here that uh, the three of them kill one third of the men by their power in their mouth. So their instructions to the men of this world are being carried out. So these three that, the four, but three of the four that are imprisoned, uh, they're using the power of their mouth, so they are communicating with the with mankind. You know, in the uh, uh, as we know, in the powers of this world, they are communicating with them to carry out things in this world to kill one third of mankind. Uh, and these these angels, fallen angels, they have tails like a serpent, and the heads, the rulers and sovereigns. They utilize and kill one third of men. So it goes back to speaking to that with the power of their mouth. They influence the heads, rulers, sovereigns uh, of the of the world to utilize and utilizing them to kill one third of men. And I compare that to like the Hydra network, as as many of us may be familiar with in in speaking uh, in those term terms. So many who do okay now and then it talks about the many who did not die but did repentance from their evil deeds you know such as praying to hasatan and idols uh many of them did repentance and those who did not repent of their sorceries fornications and theft were not spared so comparing these four angels i line this up with ezekiel 39 1 2 whether this 
is is correct or not, but when I'm looking at this, it says, And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and you shall say, Thus said the master Yahweh, See, I am against you, O Gog, the ruler over Rosh, Meshach, and Tabul, and shall turn you around and lead you on, and bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. So could these four, an four angels possibly be Gog, who rules over the other three, Rosh, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal? Could this be speaking about in Ezekiel in referencing these four angels uh, being Gog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal in carrying out these plans to destroy one third of mankind in this quote Hydra network. So that is what I tied in this this six trumpet or shofar blast in comparing that with Ezekiel and what what the Hebrew is saying uh, in the words. So that is what I wanted to share and pass it along to others. Uh, Michael. All right, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm going to start again with number eleven. So notice a trend every, pretty much every Shabbat. I have to get in my wisdom verses, and I'm going to start here. So number eleven, I will read both. So they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And in the Hebrew, and their king was a messenger of the deep, and his name in the Hebrew tongue is Avadon, and in the Greek, Apollyon. So, I did a search on Abaddon, and, and I find it really interesting that besides Revelation, it is only mentioned in wisdom literature of the Bible. So, Job 26.6, Job 28.22, Job 31.12, Proverbs 15.11, and Psalms 88.12. And then in Revelation, it's also mentioned talking about the number of the beast. So here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Any coincidence? I don't think so. So a cross-reference is Proverbs 9.14. So if we know who wisdom is, listen to this. She sits at the doorway of her house, on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their paths, Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Wanted to highlight that wisdom has guests down in Sheol. These are, in my opinion, these are the guests for her son's wedding. You know, the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is when she will resurrect people. And that also ties in with Abaddon. Um, number 12, I'm going to read both. So, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And in the Hebrew, it doesn't say well, it says pain. So, one pain has passed away. Look, two more pains are coming. And as, you know, as we continue to read in Revelation, there'll be three woes. Um, I want to read a cross-reference in Sirach. Sirach 2, 12 through 14, talks about those three different woes. So, woe to be to fearful hearts. And faint hands, and to the sinner that goeth two ways. First woe. Second woe. Woe unto him that is faint hearted, for he believeth not. Therefore shall he not be defended. Second woe. Third woe. Woe unto you that have lost patience, and what will you do when the Lord shall visit you? Uh, I just thought that was a cool cross reference. Sirach tells you about three woes, and Revelation also has three woes. Uh, number 13. I'm going to read both. And the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. And in the Hebrew, then the sixth messenger blew, and I heard a voice from the four corners of the temple before Yahweh. So golden altar and corners of the temple. I'm going to do a cross-reference. Um, in 1 Kings 2, we read that uh, Joab rushed to the altar and grabbed hold of one of its horns so that King Solomon wouldn't kill him. In other words, the altar was a place of sanctuary from the wrath of humans and of God. Is there a correlation to this? Um, in with uh, First Kings 2. I have three left. I'll do one more and pass it off to Noel. Uh, number 14. I'm going to read both. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, 
loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And in Hebrew, and it said to the sixth messenger who blew, Go and loosen the four messengers who are bound in the great river, which is called Parat. So there's some interesting things about Euphrates or Parat. So where these angels are bound, and has a, it has a notorious relationship to human sin. So the first mu murder was committed in the Euphrates region, Genesis 4 8. The first war confederacy took place in that region, Genesis 14. Nimrod began his kingdom there, Genesis 10, 8 through 12. And Babylonian idolatry sprang up in that region and will be judged there, Zechariah 5 and Revelation 18. I think there's a definite re reason why Euphrates is mentioned here. I have a few more, but I'll pass it off to Noel. Commenter. Well, I think you're absolutely right, Rob, in talking about Gog Magog here. And I was telling you guys earlier this week that this happened a few weeks ago. I think we were going over Revelation 6, and that just so, be ha that just so happened to be the week that I did the whole study on the glorious appearing of Yahushua HaMashiach. And again this week, this last Thursday, I talked about Gog and Magog and, and trying to see how it fit within the narrative. And I have a lot of questions still, a lot of unanswered questions. But then it occurred to me, as I'm studying this, I'm like, oh my, like, this appears to be Gog and Magog. I'll, I'll direct you to verse 7, where it talks about the locusts uh, with uh, were like horses that were pre prepared for war and on their heads were something like crowns of gold and their appearance was like the appearance of man um you can compare what's happening here i will direct you to joel chapter 2 zechariah chapter 12 and ezekiel chapter 38 rob i think you brought up ezekiel chapter 39 these are all famous chapters for describing this great invasion and i should also point out that whatever is happening here in Revelation, it seems to be very spiritual because there is the, the command that's going out. Now, keep in mind, they're being described like locusts. Well, what do locusts do? We all know what locusts do. They they destroy crops. You know, you, you've probably seen the, the footage of just this like black, black as pitch cloud uh, on the horizon and it's locusts coming in and they just come in and they just devour everything, right? But it says here in verse Four, and it was said to them, you must not damage the green plants or the plants of the field or the trees, but only the sons of men who do not have the mark or the seal of Yahuwah on their forehead, which is to contrast those who have the mark of the beast. Um, so hopefully that's something we all, you know, pray for and, and seek to have is the mark of Yahuwah and seek those matters out. I just wanted to point out that it, this is in complete contrast to damaging physical things. This is going after the souls of men. and. My, my understanding of Revelation has been shaped in so many ways. I've said this in past weeks. I'll say it again because it says it's right here that when, when I really got into the book of Revelation as a teenager, you know, I'm 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, and I'm reading it looking for like, I'm thinking, this is back when the X-Files was on, and I'm thinking, oh, there's going to be aliens and, you know, all, like all these, you know, just these apocalyptic, what we describe as apocalyptic events. And I was just like, oh, man, I hope I make the rapture and it'll be so terrible if I'm left behind and I'm going to be, you know, but but then you, you read this here. And when you understand the plagues of Egypt and who they were directed at and the fact that Yahuwah protected his own people. Yeah, they had to live through it, but they saw some amazing things. I mean, amazing things. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm so glad I survived another day. It's like, no, like they saw the glory of the most high, like he was rolling up his sleeve and getting to work. And so we see here in verse 20, and I believe Rob and Michael already comment on this, but it's worth repeating again. But in the Greek, it says this. Uh, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the work of their hands. Well, that's very different from the, what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, but there were still many sons of men who did not die by these plagues because they did repentant from their evil deeds. So the Greek is making it out like, like, um, oh, we got to keep killing people more and more off because there's like nobody repenting, and that's what I always thought. But then in the Hebrew it says like, no, like it Strauss says that the people who aren't killed or hurt are those who are repenting, and so this is what we have to remind ourselves on that if we are truly turning to the Most High and repenting um, of our evil 
of our wickedness, of our evil ways, and we are becoming set apart, which means to be set apart from the world through obedience to our Father and His ways, um, then these, these spiritual attacks that are coming, or at least for this generation, and I believe for our generation as well, will not affect us. And I said this last week, I'll say it again, um, I think a lot of us can hopefully agree that what we're seeing happening on the world right now across the in the narrative on every media and in, in literally every country and what all the governments are enforcing right now um, are not are not affecting those of us who are living a set apart life and even though it's looking bad like we're going to lose our jobs all these you know all these different things happening like i i, I hope everyone here has seen is seeing the provision of the most high. I said this when it when the event first was rolled out that it's going to be dark times ahead but for those of us who have faithfulness to repent and to turn to the most high we're going to see him at work in ways that the people who are not repenting and are living in fear and are succumbing to the government and all the things that they're telling them they have to do they're not going to see the most high at work. If they do see the most high at work or at least what they think it's going to be, you know, they think it's going to be through the government. So I just wanted to um, throw that out there, and I, I probably have some more to talk about, but I, I don't feel like I need to quote from Joel chapter 2, Zechariah 12, Ezekiel 30, I'm throwing those out there, because that would take a long time to read through those, but I, it seems to me like that's what is being played a, a parallel here, so you can all take note of that. I'm going to hand it back to Rob. Yeah, so I talked about both of the... Uh, uh, Shofar blasts of five and six, and my my thoughts on those. And the I think the only other thing that I wanted to comment on was I thought it was a very good point, and Noel hit right on it was that because of their repentance from their evil deeds, uh, you know, they did not die from what was going on. So I, I just that that right there also is a great hope and a great uh, positive thing to note so uh i i just want to emphasize that and 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 just bring that back up uh to the to the forefront uh other than that i am i can circle it back around until we get to uh open it up to the group but for now uh michael i'll pass it to you I really have nothing left. I guess I'll just do one last cross-reference and then we can open it up. Uh, number 21 in Hebrew. Um, but who did not do repentance concerning their sorceries or concerning their fornication or concerning their thefts? Wisdom of Solomon 12, 3 through 6. For it was thy will to destroy by the hands of our fathers, but both those inhabitants of thy holy land, whom thou hatest for doing most odious works of witchcrafts and wicked sacrifices, also, those merciless murders of children and devours of man's flesh and feast of blood, with their priests out of the midst of their idolatrous crew and their parents, that killed with their own hands, soul, destitute of help. Um, I was going to speak on the uh, the repentance, but you guys both did, so that's all I got. Um, it, we can open it up if, if we want to. Yeah, let's open it up. Sounds great. I didn't see any questions, so maybe if someone had some comments, Ronit or anybody else? Yeah, I just, um, I think that, um, y you know, I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> um, and I think it's interesting that we just read um, John um, describing the, phar the, four uh, the Pharisees uh, cutting the garment into four uh, portions. And then we switch to Revelation and we have four angels. Um, planning and executing the demise of humanity. So kind of interesting four and four. Yeah, and as Michael just wrote out, the, there's also four rivers in Genesis, of which one of them is the Euphrates, which now I'm... Uh, Rona, I... I, I put down here in my notes because I never really know because here in the Hebrew, it calls the river the Perat. I'm assuming that's the same as the Euphrates. I really don't know. I don't yes. know. Yes, 
Yes, okay. so that's a prat, it's pronounced prat, and um, in um, the Bible, it, it's always um, referred to as the great river, the large river. Um, so it's interesting that um, they refer to it here also as the, as the great river. So again, so we have the four rivers coming from the Eden region, and and we have the four angels. We have the four uh, the garments uh, ripped in fourth and in fours and John. So yeah, some interesting connections there. And what Rob? Maybe you can you can add again because you were talking about one of the four angels perhaps being Gog. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because if you look at the four angels mentioning here, it, it then it, it switches over and speaks only of three. And these three, by the power of their mouth, are, are uh, able to kill one-third of men. And it, when it talks about their tails like a serpent and, and heads, when it talks about the word heads there, and Ronit can correct me there, but the word heads is is like rulers and sovereigns. So uh, because of the translation, it, it looks like it's it's more or less talking about describing the the angels with their heads. But the way I understand it is uh, they are they are influencing the rulers of the world uh, to be able to kill one third of men. You know, working behind the scenes. Uh, orchestrating the governments and the banks, etc., to to do even if you look at today, I mean, you obviously see that with GMOs and all the other stuff that's going on behind the scenes that the majority of people have no clue. But uh, we see that these three are doing so, and it doesn't mention the fourth one specifically. And when we look at uh, the location of where the, these they are uh, prisoned, it's at or under uh, the Great Sea Euphrates in that area. And from what I understand, that area is the, if we, you look at Hyperbolia, that side, I can't remember, Ronit might have better memory than me, but I think it was on the east side, where, or the was it the south, or, yeah, I think it was the east side, where it was between that and where Tartaria would be, uh, or yes. Russia. Yeah, so we so a couple of comments. So first of all, that verse in Hebrew. Um, so I I can see how in English it would sound like the heads, like like it might be referring to the heads of those angels. Right. But in when you read the verse in Hebrew, um, it sounds differently. It it sounds like they are utilizing heads to basically execute their plan so then it sounded to us like they are utilizing you know utilizing leaders like the 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 word for head in in the bible also is used i mean hundreds of times to denote rulers princes sovereigns um, governors sovereigns you know so um so you you can also interpret it that way that they are utilizing rulers to carry their plan since they are bound <laughs> they are still bound and they are using their mouth the power of their words and mouth and utilizing rulers to carry their plan and then when we looked at the hyperborea a map uh, drawn by Mercato, um, we saw the, you know, of the of the Arctic Circle. Um, so he shows like the four rivers, um, and you could you could hypothesize that this is where Garden of Eden um, is, and those are the four rivers. So the the river that goes to the east is the River Prat. Um, and when we looked at it, it exactly goes and runs into a sea called the um, like Scythian Sea. And on the other side, you see the 
um, the two ancient empires of Scythians and I, f- I can I cannot pronounce the second name and then it says Tartary uh, all over that area so we thought it's interesting yeah and tying in Ezekiel 39 with Gog and the other three you see at the end of verse 2 it says and then bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel so that's how I, I'm tying in these four to these uh, four angels being talked about uh, in this chapter. Well, that's that's interesting because it also, and I'm really glad you brought up Hyperborea too, because it, it ties in to the idea of the Great Deep or the Abyss, which... Um, which many of us, you know, think is in the center of the earth as well, and so you would have you would have right there where all the 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 spirits are locked up, you would have them locked up there as well, and yeah, I mean, it's just it, it seems like they're whatever for whatever reason they were bound up there. It had something to do with we're not told what their I don't think we're told what their judgment was or what what they did to be bound up there. But, it, you know, it, it's, it, it places us in Eden territory. That's really, that's good stuff, guys. I, I appreciate yeah. that. So yeah. if those, I, 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 the only question I had in my mind is, are these four part of the 200 fallen angels or these are in addition? <laughs> that's kind yeah. of like... Uh, yeah, that's what my thought was, is that uh, are there other bound angels through history, time, whatever, uh, that may have done some type of sin that were bound in this this kind of effect uh, besides the 200 watchers? So I, I, I hypothesize, yes, I mean, this is one proof. Uh, if these four are not part of the watchers, then they were another band that were that were bound for another reason. and. I, I have not been able to find these four anywhere else as of yet. Yeah, that would be, I mean, my first thought, I would have to see this tied in with that, uh, these four tied in with the Watcher's account in Enoch. But my first thought would be that for any number of reasons that angels can be disobedient to the Most High and they, you know, they could be punished accordingly. Uh, I can give you one example in the Genesis Targum. Where Yaakov is, uh, where he uh, sees the the ladder, uh, Yaakov's ladder, and according to the Genesis Targum, there that two of the angels are able to ascend up that ladder that night, and they're part of you know what he sees. Those are the same two angels that were kept on the earth since Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because they actually did not fulfill their mission. They didn't actually do what they were supposed to do. And you can kind of see a little bit of that if you go back. That's a whole different topic to go look at what the angels were supposed to do and what they ended up doing. Um, but because of that, they weren't able, they were, they weren't buried, but they weren't able to return for like a couple hundred years almost. And um, so there's that account. We see, um, I'm trying to think of another uh, accounts, but there's there's probably a few others, but where we see angels disciplined, and it wasn't it wasn't just the watchers. That was you know it was mentioned because it was a big one. Obviously, that that was a big incursion that happened. That's a great point because I, I think it's I think it's very logical for anyone of us to think that if any of the angels are either a disobedient and or uh, quote fail in their mission, as you said that there is some type of consequence. And so uh, it not being quite clear on, on what's happening with these four, but obviously they, they are bound uh, in this location for a reason. And uh, what's interesting is it talks about uh, Gog and Magog coming back. And if this particular Gog, I'm interested in finding out um, if there is something said, said about uh, one of these an- these angels being released at some point. Also, that would be a great tie-in for for this. Uh, to be- yeah, you just I just that just that just struck me. Yes, yep. like I yeah. If the Watchers are released in 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 a in our in our time frame, like I would say post mud flood or mo- mud flood area. If if the Satan and the Watchers are released at that time, then 
it seems to me that uh, if Gog Magog is at the uh, identified at, as the surrounding of the camp and the blessed of the beautiful city in Revelation twenty, then very likely he is an angel that may have been among the watchers that was uh, intended for this very time. So that's I just you you kind of tied that together for me. I think that that's a very uh, that's something we should look at in the future as a possibility. Well, that and another possibility I would say is if um uh Gog came up against the the kingdom uh in millennial kingdom and uh at the end of it perhaps uh when if he was part of that and rose up against it, perhaps he and the, the other three were imprisoned uh, for either a who knows eternity or until a later time to be released, uh, and maybe that's where we are now. But I, like I said, I haven't found anything to tie that in with any other biblical or extra biblical writings. But it's just a, another theory. Well, I had never it, tonight. You know, was the first time my 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 kind of like my head's being unjarred here. On this idea of Gog being a an angel or a, a spiritual being, because we know that uh, Gog comes from the originally Mud Gog, which was one of the sons of Japheth, so one of the grandsons of Noah through Japheth, and then that created that whole kingdom up there. And so it's interesting to hear of a of a angelic spiritual being named Gog that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I have a lot of digging to do on that, and I'd be curious if there's if there's texts out there that talk about talk about this more in depth from a spiritual perspective. That's all I got on that, but that's that's just fascinating. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I had a thought about um, the Ezekiel thirty nine verse that Rob was talking about with the different names of Gog and. Uh, Misha, Tubal, and Roshi. And what you said is that the sons of Japheth, they have a Magog in the sons of Japheth. They have a Tubal. They have a Meshach. They don't have a Roshi. So I was looking around where else Rosh is mentioned, and I found it in Isaiah 66, where Rosh is mentioned with Meshach and Tubal again, as well as Javon, who Javon is another son of Japheth. Um, and then the last son of Japheth is Tyrus, it kind of sounds like Tyre. I don't know if that has any connection there. But I was wondering if these angels are more like those that are over, um, those that are like appointed over the lands of these patriarchs. You know, that is, that's another possibility uh, that uh, we know that there were 70 that were appointed above nations and perhaps some of these were them and they failed and maybe they were imprisoned for some type of failure uh, regarding that. That that's, I would see that as possible. Good point. Well, I also, I just wanted to go back to the hyperborea uh, real quick. Cause I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, Cause when, you know, I had the, th I was driving for, you know, almost all day yesterday and for those of you who are around on Thursday night, it hasn't gone up on my podcast or YouTube land yet, but I talked to, I opened up my presentation talking about uh, like electrical discharges and the treeing effect it, it creates on people and then in showing the Grand Canyon, but then rivers all over the, the world. And it really struck me. Um, now I, I could be going down the wrong uh, hound trail here, and if I if I am, then hopefully I'll be course corrected on this. But I had mentioned in the presentation because we were I was showing you a bunch of Google Earth images of rivers all over the world. Uh, we were looking at some in North America, what what may have been like a like a I think it was the Mississippi. I wasn't quite sure, but we did look at the Nile. We looked at stuff all over. We looked at Australia, Spain, uh, Canada you know, Egypt, everywhere. And what we were, we were, what we were noticing and Rob was noticing this too, is that when you looked at, when you looked at, you could see the low country and then the mountains and the snow on top. And it wasn't just the rivers that created these tree of uh, these treeing effects. It was the landscape and the mountains. And it hit me like really like 
hit me on the drive yesterday. I'm like, oh my goodness. The, when we're talking about the day of the Lord, which I believe already happened, and it, it came by fire, like the entire landscapes changed. Completely changed. And I, Rob had made the point that it, it looks like the rivers that have formed these major rivers that we call like the Nile and other things, that they're actually just filling in where the landscape was radically changed in the low areas. That's what it really looks like to me. And so when we're, when we're looking at for these locations, like where is the Euphrates River? Where is the Nile River? Where, you know, all these different things. And, and I'm of the opinion now that we actually, the landscape has changed so radically when that fire came down that everything, it, it, the, the world changed as radically in its landscape as it would have in Noah's flood. Like, you know, we, we talked about Noah's flood coming and just changing, wiping away the landscape. I feel like the day of the Lord did the same thing. And, um, and that's where it finally hit me. Like, that's why we don't know where the lands are. We, we don't know because they've changed. I don't know if anyone else is tracking my thought right now. Um, but the day of the I'm Lord absolutely. being around when? Yes. What was that, Mike? The, the day of the Lord being around when or where are we placing this? Well, I'm placing that before the kingdom. Uh, yeah. Before the kingdom was brought in was the day of Yahuwah. That was the day when he uh, he came in and destroyed Babylon and just With fire. Uh, yeah, fire, smoke, fire. Like this is you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was a sign of what would come in the day of Yahuwah. And I'm saying that that happens. And a lot of these spirits we're seeing working in Revelation, because if, if, if we recognize that spirits or uh, angels are behind like, like lightning and all that kind of stuff, and, and hail and so on and so forth, that, that these spirits we see moving around, like the 20 million and all these different stuff, they may be like just, you know, the going through just, you know, electrocuting, you know, f fire, lava, whatever you want to call it, just fervent heat, just going through and destroying everything. And, um, and so that was really, just really hit me that like the world was shaped by fire just as much as the world was shaped by water and Noah's flood. So it's kind of like, try to show me landscapes from before Noah's flood. You can't do it because it was destroyed so much. It was the same thing happened with the day of Yahuwah. Um, and so that's why I, I just appreciated Rob's uh, comment about Hyperborea and, you know, recognizing that those are four rivers that are, is more likely the original Euph river Euphrates and not what they're saying is the Euphrates now, which could just be, uh, you know, they're just trying to fill in the maps at this point. Well, yes, yes. I, I agree with that. And the fire, again, the melted buildings that we have evidence of that seems to predate um, many of the mud floods. Right. And. Yeah, we have no melted. We have melted. Story. This, this where we hear where we know the day of the Lord. The day of um, Yahuwah, um, Yahusha coming, what do you call it? The day of that day you just described. No one else is given. I haven't heard any other um, um, reason or connection to well, what caused these melted buildings, you know, like everywhere. This again shows his story. Yeah, that's in my opinion. Nothing else explains what we're seeing all over the world. Just the melted buildings, melted mountains, um, melted what could be whole cities that are now looks like hills and canyons and stuff. And you've probably all seen the mountains where like you could see the windows and the doors in it, and people think they're just natural mountains. And it's like, no, I think that was a building. Uh, it's I've all been over along a lot yeah. of coast, and yeah. it seemed like what I would consider altars. Like along the coast, I was like, this looks like an old melted altar. I've seen this in like India and other places, even here in Hawaii, where I'm like, this rock used to be something else. And yeah, now it makes sense. So that, that was, um, I had told you guys on Thursday night that before I gave my talk, I was praying for like wisdom and on this and. Uh, just I, I had this splinter in my mind about the location of Israel and all this kind of stuff, and I, I felt trapped and like it, kind of, kind of like like I hit a dead end. And I'm telling you guys, like yesterday, like it was in my own presentation, my own words, and I didn't even realize 
what I was presenting. I didn't realize the the full extent of it. Um, it just it, I, I want to call it cognitive dissonance. It just hadn't hit me yet. And it hit me yesterday. I'm just like, oh my goodness. Like the world was reshaped in the day of Yahuwah by fire and fervent heat to the to the point that like it's not even recognizable. You can't go back to Lance. Like the landscapes have just all changed. They've just been you know, shaped and destroyed. And um, that gave me, in a lot of ways, a lot of peace. And just recognizing, like, I, I, I don't need to keep problem solving something that can't be solved in that way, right? Like, we just, we just don't know at this point because it's all changed so much. And we're just going to have to live, at least I'm going to, at least from my perspective, I, I can't speak for everyone, uh, that I'm just going to just live in that, that knowledge that I can't, I can't pinpoint where things were before the day of Yahuwah just as much as I can't pinpoint where things were before Noah's flood. It's just that's just kind of the way things are, and um, anyways, that is all. So I, I, so I think the only thing is that if, um, if really there is um, in the North Pole, um, that that's the location, <laughs> the original location of Garden of Eden. Those are the rivers. Then, I mean, at least we know the initial direction. I mean, when Adam and Eve were expelled, they were expelled. Um, they were positioned to the east of the garden. So to the east of the garden, if you look, it's Tartary, <laughs> that whole area. Okay. All right. So, Thank you, Ronnie. So, <laughs> so how is yeah. that east? Just, just help me because I've thought about that. I'm like, if I'm in the center, depending yeah, that's on which the way east. I'm facing is going to be which way east is correct so how do you know this is i'm just kind of I, I'm, I'm just like yeah I, mike mike brings up a good point what he's saying is that if you're you're directly uh what we call the north pole from a you know let's say just like a globe say let's give like a globe model here you're standing on top of the yeah. globe, north pole the sun is uh well you wouldn't say the sun is moving around you on a, on a globe but whatever but the sun is moving around you how do you determine where the east and the west is because any way you turn it's just like the, in all directions i guess are south right and it's like well where's the east and the west yeah this is my question and we i i want to bring this up in some other weeks when we read about that because like running said they go east and i'm like all right well we know they do go east it ain't a question of which direction they go we know they go a direction but i'm like well, how do you do that from the center? Where is our point of reference? Um, yeah, anybody? that's a good question. I was looking at the map. Um, and well, the only it, yeah, the, I mean, the map shows it, even though it shows a flat earth and it just shows a, a direction, right? And it shows Canada and the U.S. on the west and it shows uh, what is Russia today to, to the right. Um, so I don't know. I just looked at it and I thought that's East, you know, you're right. You raised the good point. You know, there's a, there's a study that God culture did right in the beginning when they first came out using Jubilees to try to pinpoint the lands of Japheth, Ham and Shem. And when he was using the coordinates that it gave, he put it on this type of, uh, centered at the North Pole map. And it really made a lot more sense given the coordinates that were given in Jubilees when you put it on a map like this. And it was the same concept of, you know, east is, I guess you would say, counterclockwise or however, however, however that ends up working out from the center. But um, when you look at it in a map like that and then look at the coordinates from Jubilees, you can kind of get a sense of what is east and west. So I have a question. Go for it. Uh, for, I, I think for probably Noel, um, if, if if the day of Yahuwah already happened and uh, and Yahusha came back and burnt everything with fire, then that would make this a post op. Uh, I don't think I can pronounce post apocalypse post apocalypse type of world. Um, and they make all these post-apocalypse kind of movies. Um, how do you, do you, do you, am I just barking up the wrong tree here? 
Right. So one of the ways that I describe this early on, it's it it's almost like when people realize that the the possibility, or at least what I believe, that revelation is already done. They're like, well, what does this mean for us? And it's like, what, we, what are we supposed to like wander without truth now or what? What I, what I pointed out early in the series is that John is going up to a, a courtroom scene in heaven, right? They're, they're rolling out the, th- the thrones and they're pulling out documents, scrolls, and, and the one who can open the scrolls, uh, Yahusha, is like, he's doing it and then like history is unfolding because of that, because of, you know, on earth as it is in heaven, things that are being declared in the heavens are happening on earth. And it, it, it was, it was, it's, it's easy for me to understand that what John was seeing was like, these are events that were happening in his own lifetime. He was seeing these events that, but, but that doesn't mean that just because Revelation ended, that they're still not meeting in courtrooms in heaven, that the divine council isn't there. Yahuwah with all his, his angels and his Elohim and, and the, the sainthood and all these different people, and they're meeting there, and they're, they got documents and scrolls, and they're you know opening seals, and things are happening. And so the thing about Revelation is, is that people are always trying to make it, um, it's almost like you know, you're putting two images on top of each other. They're trying to open up the newspapers and say, well, you know, uh, like, you know, like Chernobyl is like, like a big one, right? We're trying to look at these different events, you know, 1948 Israel and all these things and try to make it fit. And it's never a perfect fit, but you can see a lot of similarities. And I think that's important to note, everybody, that, that you know, things that, you know, th- this idea of, of demons being released and Hasatan and, you know, stars falling and, you know, all these things like th- the repeated events. I can imagine that, l- let's just assume that we've got 10 to 20 years left on this earth, right? Maybe three years. I have no clue, but we're coming up to the end. If I were to have a vision like John, if I were to be taken up to the heavens, and see, shown the courtroom, I would imagine that I would write down like very similar events. And um, so that's comforting for me to know that it's not, not just that it's necessarily done away with because it's already happened, but it's just we're seeing the patterns of how these things do happen. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, and I don't know if that's really what you wanted me to address. If I address that wrong, then uh, repeat the question, and my apologies. I, th- I think maybe maybe she was referring to the fact that post-apocalypse, you expect uh, everything to be destroyed and, <laughs> you know, like dystopian. And yeah. what we are seeing is, um, you know, when we look at, all of those all of the magnificent architecture and everything uh we see that actually we most uh, most likely we had the utopia for a little bit um so but that that's how we we explain it with the millennial kingdom yeah uh yeah i mean i yeah i guess i mean yeah i, I believe we're post what we call apocalypse um, that happened. And, and when we're looking at like all these movies and stuff like Mad Max and, you know, these, these films. And it, it's funny how like ultimately the sons of Cain like to tell their own story over and over and over again. It seems like Hollywood is just, just the sons of Cain and Satan telling and the sons of Satan telling their story. Well, one of the things that gets us looking for the worst, well, you know, they're already slipped in the back door. And they're doing their worst. Yeah, Rebecca said Mad Max was what came to mind. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, there, it, a lot of that is predictive programming for what is to come. Um, and you, you can see that over the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, where, specifically the last probably 30 years, where Hollywood is just giving predictive programming for 9 11 for, um, you know the the what's going on right now with covid and you just you see it throughout and at the same time though like the whole mad max thing yeah like that may have been like a post mud flood event right and 
I don't know if that's what you were referring to, but it's where I say like the sons of Cain, they just keep writing. They keep telling us about their own story, their own experiences. Um, you know, like I, I did, I wrote this paper. This is a little off topic some time ago, but on Rosemary's baby, I, when I watched that film, I had never seen that film before. I saw it about a year ago and I was just like shocked at that story and going like, Oh my goodness. They're just like telling you like Satan's telling you his story about his, you know, his children. Um, they just, they slap our faces with this all the time. Does anyone else have any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, it, exceeding abundantly, you, you mentioned that the rivers could be the trenches of the sea before the flood. That that's that that that's a definite possibility, and I, I know that many people have 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 speculated on that before as well. Um, if the if the moon map is a thing, though, which I'm really leaning towards, I really think it's a thing. Um, then, then it seems like there were always oceans and rather large oceans. Um, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. You know, it's yeah. funny. Funny as as I was just talking with Rick Kummer recently, a couple weeks ago, and and we were talking about all the information we have out there, and he was basically saying we're at a point in history where all the research and information is pretty much out there. It's it, we're at a point where we just have to pick and choose because we can all like, well, I really like this and I really like that. But it's 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 almost like we have to just we have to just accumulate it all and then see, okay, how does this all fit and what do we need to disregard or discard or set aside? Because uh, yeah, it's just there's so much out there. Robbie, I think you were going to say something. Well, regarding that, you're correct. Uh, there's just, there is so much, and we have to disseminate it all. Uh, but I, my, my only comment on the uh, direction is reviewing scriptures and looking for the clues of when it says something is east or north, south, west, etc. If we can actually pinpoint and know where that is. So when it's talking about the Garden of Eden is east, well, if we knew exactly where it was, then we know where East is. Uh, just references like that. If I and I have not, my personally myself, um, done that. I know I tried in my past and I gave up. But if anyone else has has uh, been able to take the terminology uh, where the scriptures give a location and mark it as East, West, North and can triangulate it with other scripture, that would be great to know. But, yeah, I've never figured that one out. Well, if we knew where Euphrates, the true Euphrates, was, then we could, right? right. Or if we know where it is, then we could. Yeah, but in the map, the, the four rivers look the same size, more or less, and the Prat river to the east is supposed to be significantly larger that's how it, it's it's always described with that adjective um so <laughs> i couldn't figure out which one of them is larger they look more or less the same so i had a question from earlier what month, um, time of the year, do we um, are we reckoning that Yahusha crossed over? <laughs> what, what do you mean? What, what, when did he? Well, when did he die? When was he crucified? And in three days, I like to remember Rose and his sat with the Father. Um, so, what month? What time of the year? Is it I, the spring? The fall? Well, I believe it was the the. 14th of Nisan, so I, it was a Passover event. I think that the question that comes up w was w was the day he was crucified on the true Passover or the Passover of the of the Jews or the Ahudim, which you know, that gets into like the whole calendar debate, and I don't have an answer for that. But all indications, if, if I'm answering your question correctly, all indications point to the fact that it was the Passover week, the week of unleavened bread, 
um, it, you know, Feast of First Fruits right in there when all of it went down. So if the years are right, which month would that fall in? Oh, which month? Well, what we would call Nisan, which is the first of the 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 Hebrew months. I don't know which one it falls on the Gregorian calendar. You know, like was it March or April that year? I don't know. I can't answer that. Right, but it would be either March or April. Lisa, it looks like you want to say something. What? Say that last thing you just said, Mike. Excuse me. You just said what it did would you be just say? March or April. Yeah, it would be March or April. Well, it was probably most likely April by the time it was Passover. So, even if um, one of be was at the end of March, you still got two weeks to go before Passover. So it's you know the first month of the true year is when he died. If that's your question. Yes, that's my question. Yeah, I was asking it earlier for some reason. And then I'm remembering, you know, some of the, the the feast days and such. So it would have been in the, once again, um, first month, like what we say, which would be coming March, April. And in this case, probably April, because it would be a little bit later. Yeah, I've had some things um, bogging me down. I've been working on the part three that really is just a total breakdown of the whole crucifixion week and how it confirms the calendar. And so there's a lot of detail in there, but I'm hoping to get that out like real, real soon. <laughs> I was just thinking about that today or yesterday, Lisa. I was, I think just today, I was like, I wonder where she is on that article. Well, I look forward to once again and the, the great conversations that we have with it. Um, because one of the things I really like about our conversations here, and it's the way we, the way the information is shared, no one's pushing necessarily anything as right or wrong. We're looking at it as, but we, we, you know, we have a, let's just say opinion or feeling where we go, well, scriptures back this, this up and I think the way you present it in this is, again, it shows character, I believe, in terms of it isn't this way or, you know, it's almost like so many times what we grab, it, grab on is truth and we push it and then we realize, ah, that wasn't it. And this goes to what you were sharing, Noel, where a lot of people have built their ministries on a house of cards and they're sticking with it. And so... Yeah, we're in some times. Yeah, it, it's it's certainly painful to uh, when you you come up with this whole theory and you you can't back down on it because then this new information comes along and it'd be like, I'm sorry, well, I sold you guys for the last five years of my life on this one theory, but I can no longer believe that now because this new thing came up and it's yeah, it's easier for individuals um or ministries to be like sorry we're not going to change our vision because this came along we're going to stick to this and uh, it's hard yeah it's 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 painfully painfully hard to have to tell people you know disregard like all the that work i did for the last several years of my life we're we're trying something new now yeah that's gonna make it very difficult for anyone that's teaching a specific view and especially if, if they are doing a lot uh, based on it, for them to look at anything else, it's going to be very difficult. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would agree. And, and that person would have to eat a very large humble pie if um, they, they were able to make that change. Well, the only humble pie I will ever have to eat is if, it, if we live in the expected cosmology. Because here I am the unexpected cosmology, and so people who come here are to expect the unexpected, including myself. So <laughs> maybe someday I'll, uh, I'll, you know, if I ever, well, I won't, but it, I'll have to say, you know what, I was wrong about everything in that, you know, it's just, we live in a Copernican universe, and uh, King James only, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but whatever. So. 
that's what's great about like I, I set up a a website of ex- exploration and um and just you know trying to seek these things out. So yeah, thank One you for. Thing I want to share. What ask about was in today's reading of John, the first um, reading that it was. I know it's this moment is definitely described in other parts of scripture, but it was really quick. Like Pontius is like, yeah, I don't want to kill him. The Uadine, the Jews are like, no, you got to kill him. And then three verses later, he's already dead. I'm like, okay, there's the, where's, you know, we see the story. He's walking, you know, he's, got the cross he's got the crown he's you know there's this this time but in today's reading from john it was very brief all of a sudden he's pronounced you're guilty you're going to the you know we sentenced you to death and it happened um i just wanted to yeah it, it oh, was. also also it looks like he was just hung I don't know, maybe I missed something. But yeah, they use the word they use the word hang in Hebrew. It's so, interesting that it's so quick and short compared to the other uh, gospels. And like Ronit said, um him being hung and not specifying, you know, nails, uh nothing, none of these. None of this. Yeah. Well, well, this would be a yeah. good point then to That's uh, my other part. Well, you know, this would be a good part to then compare with the other Hebrew Gospels as well, because um, I mean that was a, that was a bombshell. Obviously, the whole Pharisee part, and it, it mm-hmm. really it, I've been just sitting here th- thinking about that, like how you know yes. it would be one thing it would be one thing to be humiliated and and crucified by the Romans, but at the same time. It was like, well, that's to be expected in a way that they're your your control. Your they, you know, it, it would be like, you know, the American government's, you know, cr- you know, uh, uh, executing me. But it, it's a completely different if in this situation where the Roman government's being like, uh, we're not going to do it, so we're going to hand it over to you locals, and you guys form a posse and you do it. And he's actually being uh, beaten and disfigured and crucified by the Pharisees, like the the the, the people he called the sons of Hasatan. Um, like that's that's crazy right. talk. I mean, that that's and like if wow. It was in there, it would really make more sense because these are the ones who were condemning him. These are the ones guys who wanted to do this, and those were the guys who did do this. Well, it also makes more sense when um, he had already declared. Um, you know, behold, your house is left to you desolate because he knew they were going to commit an abomination that would cause their desolation. So that, if they're literally the ones that carried out the act, that was the abomination that caused their desolation. Yeah, Mm. it it, yes. And it goes back to my comment on uh, Pilate mocking the the Yaudim uh, with la- labeling him as the king of the Yaudim and and doing so and that's why they were so ticked off because uh, Pilate uh, putting this label upon uh, the cross. And oh yeah, they couldn't 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 shift the blame. Y- yeah, so they're, they're carrying this out. The if Pilate put that on there and said, what is written is written. <laughs> you say, yeah, so they're literally now labeled as killers of their king, in a sense. Yes. <laughs> literally. Exactly. Two other points I wanted to bring. In the Hebrew, it was vinegar and salt. I don't know any significance of that, but they had salt there. And in the Hebrew, and in, in the Greek, they called the place the pavement. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Well, one thing I want to get back to uh, Ronit on is since we do have the the Gospels of Matthew and Mark in the Hebrew from these same documents, that would be interesting to cross-reference. Um, obviously, I couldn't do it in the English because, as you've pointed out, the translators have apparently purposely left out the the Pharisees out of this, which is really has me what had has me wondering like. 
why like w- w- what are they benefiting from here uh i find that very troubling yes um but it would if you can read the hebrew it'd be interesting this you know because like for example what if the other gospels don't talk about the nails right what if you were well, just strung up on a rope i don't know but it seems like this is where we can still guys can fill in the missing pieces like as as michael pointed out uh it was uh, simon right who who carried his cross beam or his cross or his um his uh was it his um his whoopee or whop or whatever uh <laughs> And his whopper, and, but his whopper, but but it doesn't it doesn't mention in the other it doesn't mention in, in John right. So this is where and, and Michael pointed out like Miriam here is up close to the, um, the 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 cross or the tree or whatever it is, and in others she's further away. So it, it's one of those things where yeah they don't all give the same details and we kind of. Uh, he was there for a few hours. So in a few hours t- or several hours or however long he was hung there. And in that time, obviously someone could be standing far away and 20 minutes later, they could be up close. Like that's what it's like, you know, at any given time, if you've ever been to a concert or in a lo- large crowd, people move around, they things happen. So it would be just interesting to compare notes on all of that. Okay. And, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, I'll have a look at the other uh, passages. And one more thing about Renit's question, um, I think the answer might be as simple as the warp and the woof. So I looked up, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster. It said the as a phrase, warp and woof together, that that phrase meant base or foundation. I didn't really know how to connect that. But um, someone else in here mentioned warp and woof as far as weaving. So I looked that up, and it seems to be that that the reason um, warp and woof may have been used here is because in weaving. The only thing that differentiates the warp from the wolf is um, their directions. If they're parallel, they're the same. If they're perpendicular, they're different. They're warp and wolf. Whereas if they were all parallel one way, they'd be all the warp. And if they were all parallel the other way, they'd be all the wolf. But when you have the warp and the wolf, they're perpendicular. So it might be a way to simply say the perpendicular, which basically means cross. Yeah, that that was my thought. That it's it's describing a a cross beam. Um, th- that that seems to be my best. Yeah, what's uh, the word in Hebrew? What is the word in Hebrew, um, Ronit, that you used? Um, I need to look back because the the transcript um, was not legible. Um, it it was very hard to read. I tried to figure out. Because I was kind of surprised about those two words also. And I just, for the life of me, but I'll go back and I'll try harder to figure out what it says. Because Uh, are you familiar with those words? Or is there a Hebrew word that would relate to that? um, So the, the Hebrew word that they used here is that they hung him. They didn't say that they crucified him. Um. And the only place in the Bible where they hung anyone was in the book of Esther when they hung uh, Haman and his ten sons. Um, so the, it, I need to to go back and look exactly how it says in the book of Esther and then go back and compare. And Thank compare you. with, and compare, of course, with uh, yeah, Matthew and yeah. Mark. Okay. And no you might be able to get, you might be able to get the the Luke document in Hebrew. They just haven't translated to English yet. But on the website, they they may offer the Luke document. The, the manuscript. Okay. Yeah, they might. Okay. Well, on that note, guys, this was a a enlightening study. You know, I, I I never know what Rob and Michael are going to present, but there was some wild things tonight, and uh, specifically uh, Ronit, what, Ronit, what she brought forward. But um, I'm really intrigued by this idea of Gog as a, you know, one of the four angels in the the rivers there. That really um, got me kind of my head, you know, thinking and turning and that kind of stuff. But anyways, I'm going. Myself, I'm going to be signing out now. I have a long, long travel day in front of me tomorrow. I probably will not be 
making it home to about two o'clock in the morning on Monday. So uh, with that, I will be signing out. Uh, love getting together with you guys. This, again, this was enlightening. Loved it. You guys keep talking. And shalom, everybody. Shalom. Have a good night. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom, Noel. Stay away from whoppers. Oh, I will. I am. I will be staying. I. I am staying away from all. Uh, all mammals. So I think a whopper is a mammal. So there you go.